Okay, so why don't we uh, um, start with you? Hello. Oh. Okay. you. Oh. I have. It's actually healing quite well. The crutches. I'm hoping this is the last day. It's only for sympathy. The crutches. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a prop. Um, no, I have a bone bruise on my foot, a concrete cinder block fell on my bare foot oh, no. on Saturday, so it's been like four days by now. You just that's how badly she didn't want to come. <laughs> <laughs> Broken, so that was a very that's, positive. Yeah, that's a real grimace injury because it's so oh, vividly oh, imaginable. It was so like, like startling too. Like they tumbled over. Like yeah. yeah, it was just like instant sort of shock. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. I'm okay. Just being okay. <laughs> being the one in for me. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I hope I described it in the record. Yeah. So when it comes to you, hi, I'm Laura. And <laughs> yeah, that's actually good to keep in my back pocket for those silly games. Okay. One thing you don't know about. Right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ted and I'm an alcoholic. Hold <laughs> <laughs> <Old> that. <ass. laughs> I'm Ted Parson, I'm a professor at the law school at UCLA, and I have the great pleasure of visiting here every summer. We're just going around the table. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I'm Laura, and I'm the communications director with the Polis Water Sustainability Project. Project and I'm running out of other Oliver jokes. You could have a meeting that was all Oliver. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Annie, I'm a research fellow here at the center. Uh, I'm Charlotte. I'm a political science undergraduate student here and I'm interested in policy. Mm -hmm. I'm Nati. I'm visiting here for a year. And I'm Rob Dobell, I'm an associate of the Center here, for Center for Global Studies. And I have I've been offered the opportunity to introduce the uh, speaker um, for, for what must have been really unmentionable sins in his undergraduate career. Uh, he and I are coming up, coming up on 25 years of, of collaboration. I used to make a joke about that, but it's almost true. It's almost, <laughs> it's, it's almost true. Uh, he did his, uh, Justin did his undergraduate work, uh, I guess, in environmental economics and uh, subsequently then MPA in public administration. Uh, we, we were associated, I guess, on a number of projects uh, along about the time of his transition from being a serious student of economics to, to something more oriented toward policy analysis. Uh, Justin went on to do a PhD in public administration here, uh, he proposed, uh, in the course of that work, he proposed a, a kind of um, set of stereotypes for, for policy analysts. And it seems as though that, that notion is being picked up in a number of other places uh, now with, with various classifications of policy analysts uh, being, being offered. Um, he then, following the PhD here, has gone on to be a postdoc at Arizona State University in uh, a new center, Center for Policy Informatics, I think, formally. Uh, he is associated at the same time with New York University's uh, center and uh, trying to bridge um, some of the differences in climate, uh, intellectual climate, uh, between Phoenix and New York City which is an interesting uh, challenge in itself. Uh, most recently has been uh, part of a team that has received a, a MacArthur Foundation grant for work on a five-year project on open governance, part of which I think comes out of work that he was doing with uh, White House projects on uh, crowdsourcing of solutions to uh, outstanding problems. So he, he while here, uh, also designed the uh, interface 
for what have been called digital fishers, which is uh, one of the very early and actually very successful crowdsourcing initiatives in which the attempt is to, to tap the uh, community of people on the internet to uh, enrich the databases that are created as a result of the underwater, uh, the seafloor observatories of Oceans Networks Canada. Uh, so that, that early work on, on crowdsourcing, I guess, uh, took him into some exploration of the question as to the ways in which crowds might uh, participate, not just in science-oriented observation and, and crowdsourcing of information, but more generally in, uh, in civic governance, open governance. So he's uh, here to talk about uh, one or two of the puzzles which have been uh, uh, entertaining him in, in the search for, for that question as to how one brings the, uh, the wisdom of crowds uh, into the processes of policy formation in the face of uh, all of the chaos and dysfunction and polarization that is observed in the uh, crowds as they show up on the net. So, that's over to Justin. Thank you. That was beautiful. I'm so happy I recorded that. And you cannot deny that in future because it's recorded. Um, first of all, I want to thank Oliver and uh, my good friend Jody and everyone here at CFGS for welcoming here as a visiting summer scholar. It's been <clears throat> the primary benefit, of course, to being back in Victoria is that my family lives here. Secondary benefit being that I'm not in Phoenix in the summertime. It was 116 last week when I did have to be there. Um, but I think that one of the really great intellectual benefits is having an office across the hall from Rod. Um, I would say within shouting distance, but I can't imagine Rod shouting, so um, <laughs> calling distance across the hall has been a great benefit uh, and does uh, revive that 25-year history that Rod alluded to. Um, I do want to talk about a paper that Rod and I have been working on for the last couple months uh, that stems from some earlier work at Arizona State that I have brought back with me and the intention is after Rod and I have got to the point where we're satisfied with the draft to take it back to my colleagues at, C at the Center for Policy Informatics and, and uh, engage some more people in this discussion. But uh, we'd like to talk to you about that paper today and get your feedback on some of the ideas that we've, we've uh, probed and sketched and see how they resonate with you. So when I first took up this current position at Arizona State, um, I was introduced to this emerging field of policy informatics, which I knew nothing about then and I, knew, I know very little about now. Um, but I'll talk a bit more in a few minutes about it, but a thumbnail description of uh, policy informatics. It looks a lot like policy analysis, but with more of an emphasis on computational and communications technologies to both um, inform analysis, to, to facilitate analysis, as well as to facilitate dialogue and debate amongst um, a wider community of actors. And um, it has this underlying it, and as, especially with my position in, in open governance, this um, openness to computer-supported public participation and deliberation. So when I first got there after this several months last summer in New York uh, and started to see a lot of internet traffic um, about this idea of the skepticism, is the nicest way to put it, the dismissal, a sort of anti-science approach to public policy. I was wondering how we come to grips with this in the context of open governance and the objectives and, and uh, intentions or hopes of, um, of policy informatics. So I persuaded along with my new colleagues at the Center for Policy Informatics in the context of a wider initiative to uh, engage in academic blogging. And we do this for a couple of reasons. We, we do academic blogging primarily to frame the ideas we're thinking about. And my, my advice or my challenge to, to my colleagues is to say, if you can frame your idea in the context of a blog that people outside of your discipline can understand, then you get it. You understand what you're, you're trying to get at. And then from there, you can work backwards to, to the academic perspective. But I think there's a great benefit to engaging in academic blogging. And it's not just about self-promotion, though self-promotion is not an insignificant part of it, especially for young scholars. 
Um, so I use this mechanism of academic blogging, and this was a jointly crafted blog post. The title uh, is, a, is a, an affectionate ripoff of uh, a paper by Barry Karen from a couple of years ago, uh, a project we were involved with. And his title was What's an Honest Policy and Policy an Analyst to Do? Um, this derived from the sort of turn of phrase in the English language, what's an honest man to do? Um, the question was, what, what's an honest policy informatician? What's an honest person in this uh, discipline supposed to do in the context of this dismissal of evidence and analysis, or the searching for evidence and analysis that supports one's position, rather than um, looking to evidence and analysis as the basis for, for developing one's position or opinion. So we, we wrote this last October, and then from there decided, <clears throat> what do we do with this? We're going to take this further and try to develop an academic article out of this. This related to an experiment with a, a computer platform called GitHub. I won't go into GitHub other than to say that the GitHub, what I'll call the GitHub exper experiment on its first pass, was a failure. It's a collaborative platform that was, is not suited to academic writing, but nonetheless, we gave it a try. Um, we might try again, but it's a very difficult platform to work with. Nonetheless, the experiment is over, but the paper lives on. And as I said, it lives on in this uh, interaction with Rod over the past couple of months, and we'll continue when I get back to Arizona uh, next week. Um, so we do want to talk to you about these ideas again and, and get your feedback and see where we are, how we're doing with, uh, with what we put together so far. So the simple outline for today is that first we want to talk about what policy informatics is, uh, what it hopes to accomplish in the context of public policy making. Second, um, what's the problem we've identified? This point where beliefs and values and opinions and evidence and facts, do they, do we say they collide or they fail to intersect? Um, do they pass by each other? Uh, and what are the various ways that the literature and the different disciplines have come to explain why facts and beliefs diverge? Or why facts fail to um, infiltrate beliefs and values. And lastly, what are some possible strategies that we might have for responding to this era of what I might call position-based evidence making? Uh, how can policy informatics, how can policy analysis for that matter, how can the wider uh, governance systems respond to this, this phenomenon of um, uh, beliefs, trumping value, uh, tr beliefs trumping facts? And I want to start with a quote that I came across a long time ago <clears throat> in policy analysis that really seemed to characterize what I'll call the golden age of policy an analysis. Everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. This is attributed to that policy actor from central casting from the golden era, <coughs> Senator, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Now, if there was ever anyone who was cast in the mold of, of what a policy analyst and a political actor in a rational policy an analysis mold is it was it was Senator Moynihan, um, you know, United States Senator for New York for four terms. He worked for the Kennedy administration, the Johnson administration, the Nixon administration, and the Ford administration before being appointed ambassador to India and then ambassador to United Nations. Uh, he practiced something that was long ago called bipartisanship that doesn't exist anymore. But he he really embodied this idea that. Um, there were opinions, but there were facts that we could all at least agree on. Interestingly, though, this quote, and I say attributed to him, something he cur certainly could have said, probably, probably did say, but in terms of fact, the only fact we have that he said this is his Wikipedia page. Um, and, the re and the reference for the fact that it's his statement comes from a book that has no reference. So um, <laughs> there are opinions and there are facts, and sometimes you can't establish facts, but um, let's take it as a widely shared opinion that Senator Moynihan said this. Um, but it's, it forms the framework for policy anal analysis, doesn't it? And by extension, that of policy informatics. It efficiently parses this distinction between values and evidence, between, fact, between belief and fact. Um, you know, we, we may not agree on the best course of action. That is an opinion. Um, your opinion about what we should do. Uh, but at least we can agree on the facts that underlie our opinions, the, the starting point from which we will have a debate about what we should do. The problem is, in the current era, this has evaporated. And this is the question to which we are turning. 
So what would he make of this current environment, this, this idea that we have debates about essentially scientific questions, the climate change debate? Um, we don't have, I'll talk about the 97% consensus in a minute, but you know, we, don't, we don't accept that as the starting point for what we should do. We're stuck at the point of, is, this, um, is it happening? Is global warming happening and is human activity causing it? Or alternatively, is human activity too insignificant to affect this problem? if the problem really exists at all. Uh, childhood vaccines are, are another nasty one. Um, are they a public health necessity or are they something that's being pushed on us by big pharma? Oh, and by the way, cause autism in children. Are GMOs a necessary part of a new green revolution or are they really just Monsanto driven um, trying to gather up uh, as much uh, market share as they can and they're really a, a threat to human health and the environment? Um, is the Earth four and a half billion years old, or is it more like six thousand? Or sorry, yeah, six thousand years old, and uh, and the Bible story is literally true, and we should be teaching that in school, at least on an equal footing with um, evolutionary theory. So, in one of the, one of the takes on this is that the current environment, um, facilitated by the internet, allows the propagation of the ideas more easily than it did in the past. That you can easily find as many of these alternative ideas without too much searching, and they can be publicized as easily um, by anyone. And perhaps a contemporary modification to Moynihan's law might now read that everyone is entitled to their own opinion and as many facts as they can find to support that opinion. So just to back up quickly and talk briefly about what policy informatics is and what it hopes to accomplish, um, as I say, it comes into this chaotic environment. It's a fledgling field of policy informatics that's trying to establish itself and getting itself a, a trial by fire. This book cover uh, signals a publication coming out from Rutledge this December, which I had a small hand in getting to print. Um, this, is the, this is what I'll call the spaghetti test of, of the, this new discipline. Um, spaghetti test is a phrase. You, you throw spaghetti against the wall and it sticks. It, it's done. Um, Maybe that's not a phrase that's well, well thought through. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> nonetheless, this is... The on the cover looks like spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> I, asked, I asked them to, to make it look like spaghetti. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a fledgling field that's trying to establish itself as something distinct from policy analysis or a distinct subfield. And again, with an emphasis on computational and communications technology. On the computational analytics side, it really focuses a lot on agent-based models, simulation, big data analytics. On the communication side, <clears throat> it's really about deliberation and collaboration and how you use these tools to facilitate an approach to open governance, whether it's open governance in decision-making or actually open governance in, in action and implementation. Um, but the idea that uh, these information technologies can improve decision support and increase the range of voices in the conversation and the complex policy challenges can be addressed by leveraging this technology. Um, <clears throat> it's, in this way, it, it accommodates, I think through this focus on deliberation and engaging people in conversation, it does accommodate this post-positivist turn in policy analysis that my tradition is more familiar with, uh, still grounded in, in Laswell's original view of the policy sciences as joining scientific analysis, analysis with democratic discourse. Um, and uh, as I say, we'll, we'll see in the coming years whether this, uh, this field establishes itself. <clears throat> but again, it, it comes into this environment and it's trying to establish itself and it's faced with this, this response of rejection of analysis and evidence and science uh, in political discourse. And what do we do about that? <clears throat> to take one example, climate change, which I don't think um, will be too surprising that there is a, there is a divergence between what is uh, professed to be belief and what is um, uh, emerging, uh, sorry, has emerged as a, a consensus or um, a, a scientific uh, perspective. So this 97% consensus, the, there are at least two very good studies that have looked at um, a large number of studies in climate science. Those that have expressed, expressed an opinion based on their analysis of whether climate change is happening global warming is happening, and whether human activity is causing that. 97% um, of those articles, starting from 12,000 in total, 
down to those that subset that has established or stated an opinion, 97% um, have said that humans are causing it and it is happening. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change stating with 95% confidence that humans have caused most, if not all, of the warming over the past 60 years. So we have a very strong statement uh, emerging from scientific analysis that climate change is happening and humans are causing it. And you ask people what they think. Uh, and the best we can do um, is it happening. Uh, currently we're at about 80, high 80s for Democrats and just hitting 50% for Republicans, believing that this thing is actually happening. Uh, the second graph says, are humans causing it? Um, again, the Democrat, Independent, Republican cascade in the same way on whether it's happening. Um, but we're, we're at 25%, 24% of Republicans believing that humans are causing it. So 97% of scientists saying it's happening, and 24% of Republicans believing it's happening. And, and the old saw about you cannot get elected, you cannot get past a primary in the United States as a Republican if you acknowledge that climate change is happening, and you certainly can't get elected if you think that humans are causing it. Um, so we have, this, we have this great example of this divergence between beliefs and facts. And if, if we can't get past the point of acknowledging whether this thing is happening and whether human activity is causing it, we're certainly not going to get to the point of, of discussion about whether and what we should do about it. Can, can I just uh, comment? There, there are actually two things going on. One is the question, do, do people believe it's happening? Mm -hmm. And there are some, uh, there, there are some studies, as you say, or a lot of studies around that question. There's also the, the question, do people accept that there is a scientific consensus around this conclusion? Mm -hmm. That is to say, the 97% consensus is itself disputed, whatever whatever that consensus says. So, so there's a, a, a sort of a second layer in this question of uh, why is it why is it difficult to persuade people? So the studies that have said 97% of the peer-reviewed papers have uh, endorsed the proposition that anthropogenic China, global warming is happening. That proposition itself, which seems more or less uh, um, factual and checkable, is itself a subject of great uh, contestation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and we and we'll return to this issue of, of if telling people there's a 97% consensus uh, actually doesn't work, and that in in some contexts will actually backfire as a strategy for convincing people that there's a problem. So why don't we move on to some of the ways in which the various literatures have characterized um, what might be going on here, what distinguishes this difference between opinions, beliefs, and uh, values, and evidence and facts. Um, from philosophy, I guess is the best way to, to situate this, this uh, line of reasoning, is first to distinguish three types of opinions. On the one hand, let's call it level one opinions, are your opinion as to whether coffee or tea is better. There is no point in debating this. This isn't something that we can come to a right answer about. You can have your opinion as to whether tea is better or coffee is better. Um, and and we, shouldn't have, uh, we shouldn't be too worried that there is a difference of opinion on that. There may be something approaching evidence and facts on whether tea, and tea or coffee is better for you, and, and it appears that the evidence is different from week to week, whichever. I only read those articles that come out that say coffee's good for you. Um, and my wife thinks the one that tea's good for you. Um, but there's no point in having a discussion about this type of opinion. But a second level opinion is, uh, what is the best course of action giving pl given plausible alternatives? And this tends to be the kind of thing about which I think uh, this has to be what Senator Moynihan, if he said this, this is what he was talking about. We can have a difference of opinion. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion about what we should do. Um, should we raise taxes or lower taxes? Should we provide more support for um, people on welfare or less? Should we um, try to reduce carbon emissions or not? This is an opinion about which uh, we, we would traditionally have policy debates, or a difference of opinion upon which would be based policy debates. Um, but what seems to have happened is that the third type of opinion, an opinion based on one's expertise and considered um, analysis of a problem, 
that a lawyer can express an opinion about something, that a scientist can express an opinion having uh, gathered data uh, and analyzed it, that uh, a social scientist, an economist, can express an opinion about what might happen in the context of a particular action. But that type of opinion, what I'll call a level three opinion, has become um, blurred between that and the second type of opinion about what we should do. Um, and when people say they have an opinion about climate change or everyone's entitled to their opinion, um, or that's just your opinion that that's happening, they, I think, are not acknowledging that there are certain levels of expertise, certain criteria upon which analysis is based, certain um, credentials that are gained over time that entitle one to an opinion which is different than simply saying, I prefer one thing over another, or I think we should do this rather than that. May I just make sure I understand the distinction between the level three and the others? Yeah. So is it that a level three opinion is an opinion held by an expert on a positive question relevant to his or her expertise? Exactly. Thank you, Ted. That's a, that's a, that's a nice um, clarification. Joseph, can you uh, add up to this? Personally, do you make an argument that this is a new phenomenon, that it's something fundamentally has shifted in terms of you know questioning the validity of facts, right? This is you know, part of opinion. So you, you seem to you know the underlying assumption is that something has changed over the last ten or fifteen years. I'm not sure. You know, is this is, is this what way of going with this as well? That you know. The, the distinction between the three types of opinion is not new. What's new is a, is a failure to distinguish. Right, and that's, that's new. No, that, that, I believe, is new. That, I believe, is new. It's, it's to engage in, in debates about particular uh, points that um, require expertise and... Uh, yeah, and you're causing it related to the internet? Is this, you know, did, did I get you right? You know, the, the internet pr facilitates it. Okay, I, I right, and yeah. I, can't, I can't pull apart which, which right came on. first or which, which is causing okay. which. And, uh, so I'm just wondering, is it that this problem is revealing itself, or is it that the expertise to go to your point about the third tier is what's contested? So once upon a time, there was this category called economists, and they could all be recognized as experts on things related to the economy, and that was satisfactory. We're now in this ultimate narrowing of society and, and reductionist. Well, that guy's an environmental economist, so he can't possibly comment on finance. You know, Et cetera, and we see that going down. I mean, you see it in the field of governance. You have, you know, the post-Marxist neoliberal governance people who can't comment on the, you know. So, so mm -hmm. is that what maybe sliding a whole host of people that were accepted as experts into this second category because they don't actually have, or at least you can contest their special expertise to do that? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if economists are the best example because I'm not sure how long that economists have actually been able to be grouped as, as um, being, able, being able to point in the same direction. Who Did was this who said, give me a one-handed economist? Was, was, was <laughs> it Harry Truman? <laughs> it's attributed to uh, uh, Winston Churchill, I believe. Okay, so contemporaries. But, uh, yeah, he's also supposed to have said, uh, I asked economists for for, uh, I asked five economists for an opinion. I get six opinions, two from Lord Keynes. <laughs> 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 but I think that's, yeah. whether it's economists or not, yeah. it's probably yeah. the case in all, all yeah. the, I mean, I don't know, yeah. fields I deal with anyways. Yeah. It, what, what appears to me to be different is, instead of saying, I disagree with the implications of the finding, or sorry, not the implications, but what we should do in response to the finding, it's to say, I'm disagreeing with the finding, and I'm going to attack the, the credentials and the expertise of the person who is offering the finding, rather than simply saying, okay, that's the finding, great, but I don't want, I don't want to do anything about that. <coughs> that, to me, is, I think, what's different. So we're arguing about these level three opinions when, uh, if we backed up and said, can we accept as fact what's been established, and then from there, debate what we should do about it. Uh, that to me seems to be the difference. By offering you the elaboration of the definition, I was I was uh, not intending to go into this territory, but I think it's, with the substantive decision we have to note, in the definition I offered you, the words expert and relevant are both fragile. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly. And we we have a pretty strong movement now that says suggests that 
economists as authoritative sources is a kind of a recent phenomenon and it's built on an acceptance of expertise that uh, may, may have pretty shaky foundations. Mm -hmm. And maybe what's changed a little bit is, uh, is the extent to which that skepticism has extended to uh, professional criteria that, that rest on scientific method, if you like, that rest on enlightenment principles. And, and so uh, I guess part of the argument is that the, the web makes it a lot easier to search around and find support for anti-enlightenment views uh, that, that then provide you the basis for your ongoing conviction. Um, I guess related to this, and I'll just flag this really quickly, is this idea of uh, epistemic relativism, is the idea that you can't, there is no such thing as facts. It's just what we all accept uh, yeah. for the time being. Um, I don't want to go down that hole, but uh, that's, uh, yeah. that's also in the philosophy of science. Um, one explanation as to why we can't agree on the facts. Um, but, but, but let's not accept too uncritically the notion that the reason we see a, a modern political phenomenon of wild contestation and attempts to deconstruct supposed factual knowledge and expertise is because Hillary Putnam showed that philosophically the fact value distinction has no validity. I mean, I think there's a sort of a, a, a bit of a lazy confounding of those two that frequently goes on, but it's, you know, the causal linkage of those two is itself an empirical claim that is subject to contestation. So hmm. when I said fragile, it's like, I actually don't want to spend the seminar here breaking the fragile things. I mean, I agree there is some real uh, practical validity to the distinction, even though I recognize it's like, it's not philosophically sustainable. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think that there is a really valid, I mean, your agenda here of questioning into the phenomena and origin of the recent campaigns of attempts to break it all apart, you know, yeah. and ways of and ways that informatics might mitigate. I think I think has a ton of value, notwithstanding the philosophic, you know, the philosophic stance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like that's another seminar is needed. <laughs> um, I beg your pardon. It sounds like another seminar is needed, but. Mm -hmm. You know, that we'd have to go into that a little bit further, but uh, not now. If you yeah, yeah uh, right. I'm, I'm actually, by articulating it, I'm actually trying to help draw some boundaries for your seminar yeah. today. I, ho I hope I'm having that effect. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. For each of the disciplines, we could have it. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, one word, one seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Next Wednesday, fact. <laughs> fact, did you say? Fact. 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 No, tact is also <laughs> We don't do tact. <laughs> don't do tact. <laughs> um, moving on from political science, the idea of agenda setting and willful misrepresentation. If one reads an, an editorial um, in the Wall Street Journal that vociferously denies any consensus on climate change, the existence of it, or the possibility that humans are causing it, um, might we pull back the curtain and suggest the possibility that the Wall Street Journal is appealing to a particular audience and has a particular agenda it's trying to establish. That if this happens a week before they know that the EPA is coming out with new stringent guidelines about uh, power, power plant emissions, can we think that what the Wall Street Journal was trying to do was signal its displeasure and attempting possibly at, at the late stage to influence the decision? Um, so it's, it's not too sophisticated, it's not too, um, too much of a leap, but it's the possibility that <clears throat> When someone says something, it's not necessarily true that they agree, that they actually believe it. And that helps to understand this difference between what sounds like a belief and what we think the facts are. Um, from uh, <clears throat> what I guess is best called an interdis interdisciplinary approach is this idea of understanding risk perceptions. And perhaps the most interdisciplinary way of understanding this is this social amplification of risk framework. Um, Kasperson at all being the originators of it and having developed over the last 20, 30 years, 25 years almost. Um, but it's this idea that risk perceptions are contextualized within social frameworks, that uh, where, you, where you stand depends on, uh, sorry, uh, where you sit depends on where you stand on an issue, that what you have to lose from a particular risk um, 
influences how you perceive it. Uh, being the, the subject of a risk that you don't have any control over influences how you feel about that risk. Um, whereas being in control of the risk uh, might make you take higher risks. So one might be able to conceivably smoke a cigarette at the same time that they're uh, looking up and worrying about chemtrails in the sky. So that helps us, to, again, I think, to understand the way that uh, some risks, some uh, perceived interpretations of facts can, or sorry, some beliefs can, can interpret facts in a particular way, and it's based on the social setting in which the, the, uh, the viewer uh, is situated. Um, from sociology, the idea that uh, there's this cascade of beliefs and values <clears throat> and attitudes. Uh, a belief is something that we think is true. Uh, it can be based on uh, something you're certain about. It can be based on probabilities. It can be based on faith. Uh, it can be derived from your experience or experimentation. It can be accepted as a cultural or social norm. It can be passed along from trusted others like a teacher or a parent. But a belief is a core um, the core of our values and our attitudes, but it is again something that we think is true. <clears throat> uh, values are linked to our sense of morality, um, and uh, they're more e easily distinguished through their connection to broader social interests. So they're stable, la long lasting, and it's what Im is important to a person. Uh, they become the standards by which we live our lives and make decisions. Um, and a belief develops into a value when your commitment to that belief grows and, they, and you see it as being important to your identity. Um, and attitudes are relatively stable systems of, I, of ideas uh, that, we, that we use to evaluate our experience. Um, situations, facts, social issues, experience, uh, our attitudes are shaped by these things. Attitudes are the strongest predictor um, and uh, linkage to behavior. Um, but uh, again, there's this cascade of they are rooted in values which are rooted in beliefs. Um, <clears throat> from psychology, a better, uh, more focused um, approach to the idea of how one's uh, beliefs and decisions can deviate from what we we might understand as facts come from heuristics and biases. The idea that there's confirmation bias, cognitive dissonance, and motivated reasoning. Um, confirmation bias is we look for things that conform to, that confirm our beliefs, and we ignore those things that contradict our beliefs. Um, and, excuse me. Okay, so not much more than that. A confirmation bias, what confirms our beliefs. Cognitive dissonance is that state that occurs when you hold two understandings that are psychologically inconsistent. We know that drinking is bad for us, but we do it. We know we should exercise more, but we don't. Um, so our behavior, our beliefs, the things we profess might be at odds with what um, we also understand, but when asked the question, is climate change happening, problem with answering yes is it causes us to have to consider changes in our lifestyle, changes in our behavioral choices, which might be inconsistent with that. And to the extent that those choices are in, uh, inconvenient or uncomfortable or simply um, really uh, go against our identity, we're more likely to uh, grasp onto the other cognitive belief that uh, this thing just isn't happening. So. Uh, and motivated reasoning is that you look for things that confirm what you want to believe. You find the things that uh, align with what you believe, and that, in the context of the internet, becomes easier where you're able to find those things, those bits of evidence out there that confirm um, what you want to believe to be true. And explains why it can be so persuasive, this counter evidence can be so persuasive to people because they're looking for ways to confirm what they want to be true. Related to that, is this idea of identity protective motivated reasoning is that you align yourself with a particular uh, culture, a particular worldview, a particular community, a way of seeing the world and a way of behaving that also aligns with 
beliefs about the impacts of that behavior. So if you like NASCAR racing, you are unlikely to believe that climate change is a threat or is caused by human activity. You're motivated by this identity. It becomes really important to you that you are part of this tribe. Um, and to dismiss that, that core belief, uh, to, to abandon that core belief and accept another core belief, really makes you question how you can be part of this community. How can you believe in climate change and be an aficionado of, of car racing? Um, so this identity protective motivated reasoning is a really powerful one that seems to be emerging lately. And this goes back to the earlier slides on political identity and belief in climate change. That if you believe in climate change, this is the problem with being elected as a Republican in a primary or a general election and believing in climate change. What follows from a belief in climate change is uh, a logical chain of events that gets you to regulating or doing something about climate emissions. And that curtails free market expression. You can't accept the premise unless you're willing to accept the implication of the premise. That's why this explains to me in a, in a large way why it's possible for most of the Republican Party to say climate change isn't happening. Because if they said it's happening, then they have a big problem, because then it's what you do about it. Because you're back to cognitive dissonance. If I believe this thing is happening, how can I not do something about it? Excuse me. Just yeah. clarification. Okay. Um, can I have a stand and I say, well, listen, my facts are better than your facts? Yes, sure. You can? Yeah. So is that biased? Is that value-laden? I guess science has developed a protocol for, for mediating that that uh, conflict. So the scientific method and, and the process of peer review and, and um, contestation is what allows us to get past that opinion. So again, back to that idea of, of a third type of opinion, which is my considered opinion looking at the evidence is that climate change is not being caused by human activity. That's, that's a valid statement, subject to test to um, confirmation by one's colleagues and contestation by, by others. Does that distinguish? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody, almost nobody says, I reject facts and evidence. My opinion about what should be done is entirely determined by a set of prior principles or religious beliefs. I mean, a tiny number of people say that. What's far more salient are people who say, no, your facts are wrong. I have other facts mm -hmm. that imply support for a different course of action facts are better than yours. Yeah. Yeah. So the mediation among alternative factual claims as substrates for, you know, is, is key, mm -hmm. which is why expertise is key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd be interested to see the 3% of climate scientists, what they're saying. Um, the 3% are just saying that it's not, either not happening or not caused by humans. It's an interesting thing to look at to say, obviously, peer-reviewed publications, um, they still have a position in the field as a climate scientist, and are willing to make a very uncomfortable statement, They're willing to go to conferences and make, you know, stand up and present papers in which 97% of their colleagues are looking at them like, what are you talking about? Um, that to me is brave, but I have no idea, I don't know who they are and what those papers are. But I That's Roy Spencer and John Christie, and you can read what they say in public. Mm -hmm. and, and there's obviously powerfully motivated reasoning going on okay. in their selection. They tend not to say things that are false relative to scientific knowledge, mm -hmm. but they tend to select things with sort of a powerful norm. Right? Uh -huh. and, then, and then there's Richard Lindzen who says, yeah. uh, it's the Holocaust again. They came for the Jews 60 years ago, and now environmentalism is the basis on which they're going to come and persecute us again. Mm. So Richard Lindzen is very old. Richard, Richard Linson is a formerly very distinguished climate scientist, now about 80, and much more saliently aware of his formative experiences and kind of political narratives than he is of his scientific uh, discipline. But he remains the most distinguished of the denials. <laughs> yeah, and he did have, uh, I guess, uh, basis for early criticism that the models left out water vapor and cloud formation in ways that, that 
has since been corrected uh, or at least uh, um, responded to. Yeah. Um, Actually, but you know, there, there's also uh, some of these folks who will say, you know, the last guy who took a position like me was Galileo. The uh, world was not with him, and, uh, and now it is. <laughs> uh, sorry, Ted, I wasn't meaning to apply the term of Benjamin Galileo. Linson would be delighted to claim the mantle of Galileo. <laughs> but but, but there, is, um, there is an argument about the bias generally in the literature and in the process that says certain kinds of results and claims uh, have a have a strong likelihood of being published. Certain other kinds of uh, equally factual uh, claims are just not of interest. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why we don't get any reports of drug trials which were unsuccessful uh -huh. in a peer-reviewed literature. Because right. peer-reviewed literature has to say something original, and it's not original to say I tried this and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Um, lastly, in this, in this list of uh, possible explanations, conspiracist ideation, uh, which is, I think, very useful for explaining this distinction between climate change, GMOs, and childhood vaccinations, because we tend to understand climate change denial as being something associated with the right, and uh, fairly or unfairly, we, we attribute uh, childhood vaccination, uh, anti-vaccination movement um, with, the, with the left. And the conspiracy, conspiracist ideation explanation is that who might be promoting this hoax? Who might be promoting this idea that this thing is happening? Um, or with respect to childhood vaccinations, who's promoting the idea that childhood vaccinations are necessary and a good thing? Big drug companies are doing it, so therefore we don't like big drug, drug companies and we don't like unnatural substances in our bodies or in our children's bodies, so that explains uh, the ability to dismiss the scientific evidence that childhood vaccinations are both safe and effective. Um, <clears throat> on, the, on the other hand, with respect to climate change, that if you accept climate change, you, expect, you accept the regulatory implications of that or the constraints on free market behavior. Therefore, it's just big government trying to impose a particular lifestyle on us or it's environmentalists trying to get us to um, be vegans or whatever it is, uh, therefore we have reason to be skeptical about the findings. Uh, this I think is a, another useful um, uh, possible explanation as to what might be going on. So I'm going to move on to what we can do about this. Just before you move on, can I just add a, add a footnote? There's a really interesting question I think to be explored in, in all of that uh, in looking at this uh, question of, of scale, a distinction between the personal decision and the collective decision. And the case of vaccination is is uh, a nice example where if you're looking at this thing from the point of view of a statistician concerned with the whole system and, and herd immunity and so on, you're looking at a statistical question which is very different from uh, the the weighing by an individual family of the set of risks that bear on the individual family. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to me that that's, that's one part of the very interesting uh, challenge of dealing with what are effectively commons problems, they, the, the consequences as perceived by the individual are very different from the consequences as perceived by the statistician looking at the system, uh -huh. which is why we have all these problems of of um, caseworkers fighting procedures manuals and, and so on. A really interesting challenge. And in fact, the Daniel Kahan paper that you, you mentioned on motivated reasoning talks a little bit in terms of that notion that the, the consequences that bear on me personally uh, of accepting the evidence on climate change are, are very different from the uh, importance of my decision in the big collective scheme of things, the standard problem of collective action. Uh -huh. But anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a theme to follow up. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so let's move on to um, some possible 
responses that have emerged, some strategies that we might uh, consider in, in light of this phenomenon. Uh, because science is a hashtag that's emerging in social media, uh, it's a shorthand to say um, we, we shouldn't argue with scientific findings. They should be the basis of social decisions. This is a highly technocratic approach uh, that I think fails to recognize the position of analysis and science in a democracy. Um, but it is, it is a powerful response to say, but the reason we should do this is because, because science said so. I don't think this movement has considered the implications of this, but nonetheless, it, it is emerging as, a, as one response, um, perhaps a backlash against anti-science rhetoric. Uh, regulating public discourse, good example out of Australia just from a few months ago. A very powerful group in Australia, a very successful group, the Australian Vaccination Network, that sure sounds like <clears throat> they're pro-vaccination, they're actually an anti-vaccination. Um, advocacy group. They were required to change their name to the Australian Vaccination Skeptics Network. <laughs> they, were stripped, they were stripped of their charitable status. Um, and a warning was issued from the government that the group was spreading misinformation and the government is engaged in a very active pro-vaccination um, social marketing campaign. In, you know, this wouldn't happen in the United States. This would be seen as curtailing free speech. Um, I think that Australian government didn't curtail their speech. It simply um, regulated it and um, put constraints What's on it. The they, they are still out there talking about what they're talking about. And the thing is, they believe it. And again, I don't think that there's any agenda behind what they're doing, other than they think that it's true that vaccines surely, cause. Surely revoking their tax exempt status is a curtailment of their speech. I would say the contrast between, it's almost like the Clarity Act, you know, demanding that the name represent the objective accurately mm -hmm. some object, is one thing, but revoking the tax exempt status is a huge burden on a, on a not-for-profit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it, it actually makes sense to distinguish those two as responses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we uh, United States and Canada, have been looking more intensely at the records of environmental groups as an example mm -hmm. to see whether they're conforming to the regulations of their tax exempt status, but that's to say what are they supposed to be doing and are they doing that? Yeah. If this group is simply doing what they would, what can be legitimately called public information, um, you're right, they are constraining and curtailing their ability to engage in public information through revoking their tax status. So it is an extreme position of the Australian government, the Australian government thinking that this group uh, and this movement was very powerful and was a direct threat to public health. It goes to this issue, and this is, a, I would never ask for a show of hands, but um, you know, there are parents who will vax, who will, who would never consider not vaccinating their children, and there are parents who will not vaccinate their children. It's not something to bring up at a dinner party as a conversation. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, people believe something, and they believe it deeply. And as Rod alluded to, there's a difference between perceived risk uh, as to oneself or one's child, and perceived risk more broadly. And where the intersection happens is that people believe, people who believe that all children should be vaccinated also by extension believe that that issue of herd immunity and the elimination of particular um, uh, viruses is, is, um, requires this immunization. So the point at which it becomes a public health issue and not a personal choice issue is an interesting intersection in, in this issue of childhood immunizations. Better science communication has always been around. It's always something we've talked about, the science policy interface forever. We just have to get better at it. Scientists need to get better at explaining the science to politicians. It, it has this tinge of kind of like politicians aren't that smart. You have to speak in, in words of one syllable and say it slowly and repeat it. Um, you know, the public's not capable of understanding the science. We just need to explain it better. Uh, I, 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 there's, scientists are sometimes so naive in this respect. They, um, to really ignore his motivated reasoning. It ignores all the other things we talked about. It's not that scientists don't need to do this stuff, but it's not gonna fix things, I don't think, by simply saying we just need to communicate the science better. Uh, related to this, and one step further, is the idea of value-based science ad advocacy. Scientists actually need to get into the values-based discussions, into the political discussions, put themselves out there and say, look, I've studied this stuff for years, you know, I may get paid for this, but at the same time, I believe this based on what I've done. Um, nice paper here by Thomas Dietz in um, uh, 
Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, bringing values and deliberation to science communication, making the argument that this has to be part of the activity of, of a scientist to engage in public debate. Uh, we go back, my, I remember examples, Ted, from the ozone depleting substances early days of um, Molina. Uh, it was his, uh, there was one of them, it, I don't think it was Molina. Roland. 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 Sure, went, sure, Roland. Yeah, and, and went, you know, to city council in, in whatever town it was in Michigan and said, this is a big issue, you have to ban CFCs. That was, uh, that was actually Rick's, uh, Rich Dolarski and Rob Cicero. Yeah. We were both in Michigan. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the, but this idea that they were one of the early examples of scientists stepping outside of this boundary of, of dispassionately simply saying, here's the evidence, to, to going and being public advocates for decisions based on what they saw as that evidence. Um, so my comment about values-based science advocacy is, um, you know, you first. I'm not going to do it. I'm not sure if that's an abandonment of my responsibilities, <laughs> but I live in Arizona. I'm not really too interested in putting myself out there um, in public view too often. I, I exaggerate, but nonetheless, it is a consideration. Uh, argumentation. We simply need to argue about this stuff. Too bad. You can't simply do this kind of like the science says so, so do it. You actually have to engage in the political dis discourse about arguing about what you think is the right thing to do. Um, and there's two different ways of doing this. Habermas, which is all about deliberate democracy. We just need to get together and talk about this. And we talk about it forever, theoretically, but eventually the unforced force of the better reason will prevail and we will come to consensus on what is the right thing to do. Theoretical position, but I believe this because I believe it happens It happens in our daily lives. It happens in our families. It happens in our interactions. It's just hard to do when you scale up, really hard to do in open governance. In a stance of equality, which says what about expertise? I mean, a Habermasian dialogue situation presumes a kind of a, a, a fraternity, a, an equality a yes. stance. Yes. And yet, um, you want to invoke expertise. You want deference based upon claims of greater knowledge of certain positive facts. So isn't that precisely in contradiction? He would argue that it is your expertise which should prevail through the unforced force of the better argument. So the better argument will prevail eventually, it's just hard. It's really hard. As, it takes as eventually consensually recognized by all your peers yes. in a Habermasian yes. situation. Yes. I know. I know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it works at very small scale. It falls apart at large scale, and the question is, is it something about scale that happens that it, it causes it to fall apart, or it's simply, it's, it's idealistic to think that you could take a family discussion about um, where's the best place to go on holidays this Christmas, mm -hmm. and scale that up to a nation as to what we should do. I've never been able change. to get my brother to accept my expertise. I sympathize. I have four of you. I was going to say, you, you accept my expertise a lot better than my brother does. <laughs> maybe, maybe he knows something we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he has other expertise. He knows certain things, <laughs> but I claim they're not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> The alternative to the, the Habermasian perspective is the uh, 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 agonistic or antagonistic democracy, Chantal Mouffe being uh, one of the leading advocates of this. You basically have to argue about this, and, and in the end, you know, you got to decide what you're going to do. Not everyone's going to agree, but uh, argumentation is, at least is, be is better than um, force. Um, but in the end, you have to agree how you're going to decide things, and whether it's majority rule, or whoever happens to be in power at that at that time, or some kind of constitutional authority, uh, agonistic democracy acknowledges that we're not going to agree on everything, but we at least should talk about it because it's going to be better um, to to have um, talked about it and uh, shaped some perspectives along the way. Sorry, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Bye bye. Um, Decoupling identity and belief speaks to this work by Kahan and his colleagues at Yale about identity protective motivated reasoning. Can we get to the point where we can make it not so important that accepting something uh, aligns with you abandoning a particular identity? That you can accept that climate change is real and still be a fundamentalist Christian? Um, that you can, um, I don't know, just Trying to get get to the point where you can 
disentangle those two things and not make it so important to one's identity that uh, you can't afford to believe something. Some people are in a position where it's simply not possible. That if they, if a, a pundit on Fox News all of a sudden came on their show one day, Sean Hannity went on a show one day and said, everybody, I've decided that climate change is real and it's important and we're causing it, that is the end of his career in that, in that organization. It would quickly spiral downwards and he would not have a job within two months. So it's too important to his identity for him to make that statement, so we can't really expect him to. But are there other situations in which we engage in public dialogue where we can make it less about accepting or dis, um, disentangling or dismiss, distancing yourself from your identity? Can you believe in climate change and not, as a consequence, have, it such, have such a profound impact on your identity? That's one. What that looks like in practice, I'm still working through, but that's one possible strategy. The last thing is something that is, is really fundamental to the approach we're taking at the Center for Policy Informatics at Arizona State. It's this idea of synthesizing empathy, because it comes down to the question, what changes your mind? Rod pointed me to a, a book from the 70s. Stafford Beer, famous for having invented the uh, uh, project CyberSyn, right? in Chile. So when Salvador, uh, Salvador Allende government came in, they brought in Stafford Beer to create this project CyberSyn that was going to link the entire country together and take a technocratic approach to running the economy and running society. It's a brilliant. It looked like Star Trek, this set. It was actually smashed by the, the Pinochet government, uh, like literally smashed by them when, when they, uh, after the coup. But nonetheless, a really interesting, really interesting person, Stafford Beer. Um, but he talked about what changes us. And in the idealism of the 1970s, his, his view was information is what changes us. I don't believe that's true. I think experience is what changes us. What changes your mind about something? And the idea of synthetic empathy is to say that you become empathetic about a situation. You become, uh, you experience something and become concerned about it in a synthesized way. We see this works in a natural experiment. People are more concerned about climate change when there's a heat wave than when the weather's kind of normal. Um, <clears throat> extreme weather events cause people to be more concerned about climate change. We can't do that in an experimental way other than to observe what happens naturally. But we can synthesize experience. Um, yeah, we can synthesize experience to say, imagine what the world would look like in 40 years with unchecked global warming. We can use visualization, we can use situated simulation. Um, I think this is a really powerful way to go. It, again, the problem is it works at small scale. That people will, you can get 12 people in a room to, to imagine this experience or to, to visualize this, um, this possible future state. But that's 12 people at a time and that's small scale. And how we do it in larger scale is more difficult. Um, but I think it's a powerful way to go, uh, is this idea of synthesizing experience. Uh, and the specific phrase that Center for Policy Informatics uses is synthetic empathy. <clears throat> so that's some ways we think we can come, about, come at this problem of this divergence between beliefs and facts. Um, <clears throat> I want to pose one question, open up a general question, and then open it up for discussion. The one question I have about this belief in anthropogenic global warming, um, what if all of a sudden everyone agreed it was happening, that humans were causing it? Where would we be then? I think the environmental movement might be, um, though it's very frustrated with this current position in which there is still debate about whether climate change is happening and whether humans are causing it, I don't think they would be happy with the second stage, which would be everyone agreeing, yeah, it's happening and we're causing it. Because I still think there would be this second stage the second type of opinion that says, yeah, well, what do we do about it? We're starting to see this in some nuanced modification in Republican rhetoric around climate change. People like Marco Rubio from Florida is dealing with a situation in which Florida is going to have soon catastrophic impacts from things that look like climate change, and whether it is or not, it sure looks like climate change. Uh, sinking land levels, rising sea levels, and increased storm activity. They can't afford to not talk about the implications of climate change. But he's going to be very careful to talk about it in a way that says, this thing might be happening, and we might be causing it, 
So we might have to do something about what might happen. He's not talking about we might have to do something about stopping it, so there's no mitigation talk coming out of the, this new rhetoric uh, from the Republicans, but there is some, a lot of talk about adaptation, higher seawalls, uh, flood protection, uh, what have you. <clears throat> so that is gonna get us to a point, I think, fairly quickly, where with respect to climate change, there's gonna be greater widespread acceptance of the uh, fact of climate change and the fact that humans are causing it. But that's not gonna solve the problem about what we do about it. So this, is, this problem that we identified, the divergence between beliefs and facts, uh, is a problem we identify some possible solutions, but solving that problem doesn't then say there are no more political problems about what to do about these problems in the future. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, I'll just say that the question is, what do we do about this? What did, how does this, other than a survey of these literatures and, and situating them and trying to understand this phenomenon, what, what flows out of this? I think the synthetic empathy question is, is interesting. Um, I'm dealing with this problem of open governance and how we can have open governance conversations when we have such fundamental disagreements about the, the basic facts of the argument. I go way back to the Commission on Resources and Environment, which was a type of not really open governance, but a op more open governance, in which we tried to talk about land use planning in the province. But the, the basis of those conversations was all the factual basis of the land mass. What exists in particular land masses around the province, and can we use GIS to inform that? That's the starting point. What we do about it is the problem, the next problem, the, the, the debate. Um, so can we get back to something like that, in which we can inform open governance conversations usefully um, with a factual basis and, and stop miring ourselves in a discussion about what's effective and what's not. Thank you. So I'm just going to pick up on your first sort of posed question. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think I'm going to put words in your mouth and you can Go ahead. First okay. refute them. But it seems like you're implying, you know, if you could get past that first tier of lack of consensus, you, you know, you're going to be no better off. It's going to be just as complicated. And I, I probably would disagree because I think what you do is you begin to get a subset of solutions that will be equally difficult, I agree, but you're not dealing with quite the range. So when you talk about this example from the Florida fellow, I mean, if one assumes that it is happening and that humans are creating it, your, even though it's not mitigation yet, but your adaptation options are much smaller okay. than they are if you assume that it's just sunspots or some other random activity. Right. Because if you accept that it's real, and then you're doing an activity that although you're adapting in the short term, in the long term you may not, or you are actually exacerbating the problem, that surely in a public discourse sort of way would become an eliminated option. It would be very hard to defend that, at least for a long period of time. So agreed it gets maybe harder, but your onion is getting smaller mm -hmm. at least. So you're okay. cutting down tiers and that would be there would be huge value in that. And my second point to that is there is a small subset of society that we allocate enough resources to do this work. They are spending all their time, the majority of their time, at the first level of, of battle, let's call it, versus actually working out, right. here are a series of solutions, these are the preferred solutions, let's use all these techniques that you've identified um, to get over the problem, to have that conversation. They're not even doing that, really, because they're too busy trying to make the case that 97% is enough for consensus and that we shouldn't be creating that part anymore. Right. I so agree. it's a waste of social or societal resources yeah. that we would at least be minimizing. Right. I don't disagree with anything you said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just maybe I can push a bit on, on this tension that I see here. On the one hand, you know, you're very active in open government, right? you know, promoting the liberation of these options and so forth. At the same time, you seem to suggest this directly that some of the Broad deliberation by the internet and so forth has undermined you know, some of the rationality of you know uh, more um, or better exchange of arguments, you believe in facts and so forth, right? And so I'm just wondering whether you you think you know, opening it up to more and more actors, right? You know, in terms of the internet, democratizing knowledge and all this is a solution to go, or whether you see a more enlightened elite, right? Yeah, would be better to serve, uh, would be better, you know, in terms of serving, you know, the, 
more rational outcome of the whole process. I'm just wondering you know, <laughs> where you're leaning in terms of discursive uh, dimension of doing this, right? Is it, you know, really if you, if you have an enlightened public that debates and deliberates, right? Is this the way to go? Or do we need, you know, the Australian regulation way, right? Yeah, do we need an enlightened government to step in and say, yeah, we need a framework within which we organize this, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm just wondering, because I know your own background, right, is very much, you know, make knowledge available, but yeah. it seems, you know, it also invites all these people on the internet to come up with very interesting stuff. Right? <clears throat> no, it doesn't, it doesn't take long on the internet to, to lose your faith in humanity. <laughs> to, uh, engage in useful ways. There, this really is a core uh, a core debate in the MacArthur Foundation Research Network that Ron alluded to. Uh, the difference, and I think it's characterized by this distinction I noted between a Habermasian approach and an agonistic or antagonistic approach. Uh, there are phrases like, we need to crowdsource wisely rather than crowdsource widely that there is some, some kind of gate or mechanism by which people enter a conversation, an a more open conversation. So it's not wide open, but it's more open. So I don't think there's much, uh, there's much uh, debate or controversy about the idea that getting more people uh, focused on, uh, on, a pro on a problem opens the possibility that you can come up with a more innovative solution. Um, but the problem that we see in this primitive stage of the internet is that just opening the doors leads to useless chaos that um, most people disengage from rather quickly. So how do we do that in a way that filters activity without overly, overly constraining it? One of the things I'm, I find promising, and you'll be familiar with the, the idea of MOOCs, the Massive Open Online Courses, those are essentially, as the name suggests, open. You look at the discussion forums in a MOOC are remarkable for the quality of the contributions. And for me, there's a couple things that are of interest going on there that are useful lessons. Two things are interesting. One is people join those communities for <clears throat> self-interested reasons of their own betterment. They're trying to take a course and learn something. They, they bring to the experience a, a personal investment. The second thing that happens is the process of learning leading to the discussion modulates and frames the discussion that happens. So whereas you look at a newspaper column online and the commentary afterwards, you generally get the impression some people may have read the headline, they may have looked at a couple of words, but they didn't really read what was in the article and comment on the article. They're simply making a statement about the general premise or general position of the article. That doesn't happen in a movie. The conversations are really, uh, really fruitful, really engaging, thoughtful, and, and constructive, and, and, and contribute to the quality of that course. If we can take that kind of learning, that people bring a personal investment to it, and secondly, there's a process of learning. Again, back to my point, how do we inform this debate, these deliberations online? I think we might get, we can't help but get better at it, <laughs> get worse at it. Um, but that is what gives me hope, is that we're at, a, I think, a really primitive stage, and we just have to keep trying to get better. Yeah. And the medium is, is clearly you know, an important factor in this, right? How do I still have to believe in newspapers, right, and deliver it in you know, communities and, and so forth? I think that's quite outdated to look yes. at how public deliberation unfolds these days. So, you know, thinking about innovative ways to use modern communication technologies and make it, you know, give it a framework within which you know, kind of a more rational discourse can unfold. But yeah. I think that's, that's definitely one way to go. Mm -hmm. I might push on that, though, because I'm already, I guess, I'm new enough that I, or old enough that I remember World War II didn't use the internet, right? but I'm obviously mainstream now. But I don't know that that reflects human experience at all, because human experience all through history before that was specifically not anonymous. And this is the first time that we are actually facing something that makes us anonymous. Yes. And, and I actually don't think that's the human experience at all. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, maybe it becomes a new kind of thing, but until we get past this anonymity, you can I, never have deliberative democracy. You can't have any kind of thing in an anonymous environment. I couldn't agree more. I think the anonymity problem is huge. It allows people to say things they would never say in a, in a public forum, in a face-to-face -face forum. 
and that's it's a huge problem. I can't believe that we're still struggling with that. And some some platforms are trying to modulate it, um, but it is still something about the computer mediated setting that allows people to say things they just would not say. Wouldn't that be more honest though? It opens the discussion to be, you know, it doesn't have to be rude, but it, it, it could be, it could be like you're, you're already touching the, the, the issue that, important, that is important to you. Right, right. I mean, there are some, certain circumstances in which anonymity protects the, the well-being of the person making a, a controversial statement. Um, but generally, more often than not, I, I find anonymity simply allows one to not be responsible for the statement they're making. Very interesting talk. I just wonder, so one thing that just stood out to me is, is missing is you didn't talk much about the political culture that you work in. Um, I'm thinking here in terms of, you know, the independent thinking, the independent as a political culture, especially in the United States, and um, and also as a, as a strategy, critical thinking education. I mean, uh, you know, we don't have to have people all working on the problem, but people that are able to, you know, uh, engage with uh, things like that as a strategy, but but they, they, but just to, to push the point about the political culture of the independent, especially in the United States, it seems to me that that might be one of these big drivers here. Like there's a lot of, you can imagine that someone uh, it gets quite resentful of somebody who's defending a position which the experts might all agree on, but which the person who's defending it is not very well informed. Mm -hmm. You say, oh yeah, well, because science, and they don't really know much beyond that. Mm -hmm. The person that's arguing that position their interlocutor is going to resent that. They'll be like, well, what do you know? All that you did is you found that out on Twitter, uh -huh. right? And, uh, and, mm -hmm. and and push back against it in that way. And I'm an independent thinker. I think for myself, right? I look for my own facts, et cetera, et cetera. And, that, that, and that, that's an intractable, very deep part of the political culture um, that, uh, um, um, well, certainly in the southern United States, but I mean, just if, you know, in the Western world, Continually advancing problem. So mm -hmm. I wonder, like, how would you respond to that? Does you know, um, the role of the independent and the role of sort of critical thinking as a as a way of trying to mitigate this through maybe education policy? Yeah, I wonder to what extent this this issue, and it sounds kind of scary, but this issue of conspiracist ideation gets at that a little bit, which is to be skeptical. It is just a natural skepticism to say, oh, that's being pushed by something I don't like whether it's too much government or too much big business. I have a natural skepticism that causes me to come at that issue with a, a jaundiced view, which I then, again, being an independent critical thinker, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at this, and then the problem is, the surplus of evidence available allows you to find the things that support that position. So then, you're, then your motivated reasoning takes over. That might be my concern. With respect to education, um, there is a good example of in de decoupling identity and belief. Teachers who work in science in school boards in which creationism is taught are finding ways to speak to high school students about looking at creationism and evolution, evolutionary theory, as uh, alternative viewpoints and allowing the students to critically examine those things themselves. So both teaching the skills of critical thinking and at the same time in that particular issue, um, you know, walking that tightrope of working in a school in which creationism is taught, but at the same time trying to teach evolution at the same time um, is, uh, I think, a good example of how you can use education to not ask students to say, your parents told you about creationism, but that's BS, you know, I'm gonna tell you about evolution, is simply to say, there are different ways of seeing this issue. I'm going to present them as dispassionately and equally as I can, and then encourage you to come at it with a critical, uh, a critical review. Does that seem to? Is that one way of? Yeah, I mean, but the, there seems like there's like there's a there's a danger in, in sort of a poor critical thinking education, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't quite go far enough. That just teaches you to look for the problem or just be independent, but doesn't actually teach you the skills of, for instance, identifying rhetorical. Mm. That kind of thing. Mm. Right? 
Um, uh, so you'll, you'll often get, like, if you, if you uh, for whatever reason, cruise the chemtrail YouTube videos, that kind of stuff, right? They all mention this kind of thing, that they're independent, that you, they're, they're resentful of herd mentality. Right? They're, yeah. they're resentful of, of people just accepting what the experts say. And it, and it seems to me, again, deeply tied to, um, tied to, uh, um, well, it, it, it's an identity, it's an identity mode, but again, it's, it's, a, it's a political culture that's, that's at play here, that's very strong, that seems to be working against this uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, um, uh, it, well, accepting what, you know, we've been socialized into, into academic life to accepting expertise because we understand how peer review works, et cetera. Rather in the group, in that sense, the voting the voting public has not been socialized in this way, right? But this is they kind of got critical thinking, but it's very poor critical thinking. They've got the attitude, they don't have the skills, uh -huh. kind of thing, right? So I mean, as a, again as a strategy, it just seemed to be missing on your on your list of strategies, right? That is good critical thinking education yep. as a policy. Mm -hmm. Would be a way to like a long term mitigation of this, like just as something as simple as teaching kids to recognize fallacies, right? Like right. That kind of thing, and, um, and that yeah. would be useful to distinguish it critical thinking from skepticism because skepticism has become sure. a, a negative label. You're a skeptic, right? Which means it's not that you're like you know, you've, you've researched this and you come up with an alternative view, it's you rejecting this, this science without other than saying, I don't, I don't like it, it doesn't align with what I. So I think that's that's a really useful uh, contribution to, to distinguish from critical thinking from skepticism and to focus on that, uh, which I'm sure any ed education system worth its salt would, would probably say they do uh, encourage critical thinking, but we can always get better at it. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. sure. this, this, I don't know what political science can do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. but it is education. This is the maturation of that, because it's one thing to claim that we promote critical thinking versus sort of being able to demonstrate that you're actually conveying those skills. I mean, you have to be able to articulate what those skills are, is that the kind of stuff you're talking about, and then demonstrate that you're, you know, it's an easy claim, I think it's hard. I think you could make it more substantive. Taking a course at a university does not teach you critical thinking, uh -huh. unless somebody overtly is showing you a pro and con, and, and, and giving you, I mean, I'm experiential based, so I, 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 I buy into that, to use their critical thinking to decide which one they believe, doesn't that sort of undermine the whole one, two, three tier levels of expertise? It, it does, but it, it's in the context of environments. You have to understand uh, the Deep South, there, there are school boards in which creationism is taught. It is part of the curriculum. So you, and, and kids who are raised in that environment their entire lives. So it's trying so, to work within an undesirable situation. Exactly, and if you, if you come in as a science teacher and say, all that stuff your parents told you is wrong, you, you threaten their identity. And that's the lesson with respect to motivated, uh, identity motivated reasoning, is try and get that science across without threatening their identity. They can still be who they are, they can still love their parents, they can still go to church, but there is this alternative way of understanding the world. And, and the way you do it with evolution and creationism, there's, there's two types of creationism I learned recently. Um, there's old creationism and new creationism. And old creationism says the Bible is an allegory for the way evolution happened. 
So we accept that evolution as a scientific fact exists. It relates to intelligent design to say, you know, animals just didn't happen. They happened through creation. That there, there was a supreme God who created all these things. And a day in the Bible is a billion years in the history of the earth. Mm -hmm. And we can understand the science of evolution in this metaphorical way. That's a way of bridging between new creationism, which is the earth is 600 years old. Right. People walk with dinosaurs. Yeah, dinosaurs exist, but they existed 6,000 years ago. Um, Adam and Eve actually came out of the Garden of Eden. Okay. Out of the world. So, and then God wiped them all out in you know, a flood and then started all over again. Yeah, um, sorry, but where would you draw the line? I mean, are we going to debate next whether the earth is round or flat? I mean, th this is critical thinking, this is, this is violating basic facts and basic science. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it, the, only with respect to this issue of creationism is, is you cannot convince somebody if they were grown, if they were raised in a culture that the earth was created in, in six days. You can't get them out of that by threatening their identity. But there is a way of, of um, passing along that science. Yeah, but, but then giving them the, the alternative of accepting what the other school is saying, yeah. 100%. Mm -hmm. So, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I've never thought through whether new creationism, this idea that, sorry, is it old creationism? Whichever, the one that accepts that evolution happened, but it happened in a, the, the Bible is an allegory, and each day in God's life was a billion years. Um, I haven't worked through whether that causes you to have unscientific beliefs. Because you're accepting the science of evolution. You're simply saying there's this, this higher power that, that has caused all these things to happen. It does, the problem with that, I guess, the problem with magical thinking is that anytime there's a problem, there's magical thinking. We're not going to destroy the earth because God won't let us. And even if he does, we'll have an ark which will save us. Or a rapture. Yeah. yeah. I think we may have approached the point where we should draw the level well, okay. uh, uh, Don't mind not catch oh, sure. okay. well, Hopefully it'll be a very quick one. You see, it was just in passing, you had mentioned about, um, sorry, so the, the political scientists and the and <laughs> stuff. So uh, you, you mentioned about the you know, so Republican primaries, right? And now we can't get past the primaries unless they deny uh, uh, and climate change. Um, but you, you mentioned that it's because there's something about like accepting the premise undeniably leads to these implications. But what, what do you take of the view of that, you know, the, those premises are themselves implications of prior premises, are they not? So I mean, like, where, how did, um, what do you see is happening there? Like, why, why do they choose this premise as being the one that's unacceptable? Why not prior ones as being unacceptable, right? Like, like a, um, you know, global warming is not is not a, pr a premise ex nihilo, right? Yeah. Like it, it comes from it's an implication from a whole bunch of prior the prior evidence, prior uh, prior premises, right? So, um, what's going on there? Why is it that uh, why is it that they can um, uh, why, why is that the starting point for the premise that's unacceptable? <laughs> and that, uh, huh. Well, isn't it, isn't it? Closer to the uh, to the consequences uh, in this notion that moving from an emphasis on mitigation to an emphasis on adaptation mm -hmm. is making it a lot easier to swallow the premise of anthropogenic global warming because adaptation is good for industry. Adaptation creates jobs. Adaptation is part of our economic system. Adaptation does not imply government regulation constraining us or our, our own behavior or industry. Uh, so, so accepting AGM takes you uh, into, into that choice. You can focus on the adaptation side. It becomes acceptable. It's harder to go back and say, well, all this AGM stuff is built on um, global circulation models, which rest on uh, Maxwell's equations for heat transfer or, or something um, that, that gets more fundamental and, and is less threatening. So is, isn't it basically just that um, believing in the evidence for global warming is, is only one step 
I'm saying we're going to have to have a carbon tax. But it's, it's interesting just it, it, closer to the premises that you don't like. Right. Fair Sorry. Right. But, it's, uh, you but I mean, it's interesting because it mirrors what comes after that, which is what you say. Well, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Given that we accept this premise, okay. So you're saying that everything prior to accepting the anthropogenic uh, uh, climate change uh, premise is too obscure, basically. It's you hard. It rests on. It's much too hard to understand. But you're you're, you're uh, saying that you know there's this sort of uh, there's this inevitable move from accepting this to these policy implications, i.e., you know, uh, uh, impact on industry um, uh, and jobs and uh, economic consequences are the inevitable policy consequences. It seems to me that in, realistically, you know, as, as a, when you study studies policy analysis, it's, it's, it's equally complicated what you do after accepting that premise. Sure, and I, I don't disagree, and I, I don't mean to imply that I believe that the consequences are yeah. necessarily, it's that the, the argument against accepting um, climate change is that we'll then have these bad consequences, either a carbon tax or restrictions on industry. But if you look at what they did with, carb, with the cap and trade um, on sulfur dioxide, when acid rain was a problem, any industry that went through that is pretty happy with the outcome. They made a lot of money from cap and trade, sure. and they got a lot more efficient. This is the thing that's kind of surprising about climate change. Any industry that argues against um, energy efficiency, that's a weird argument to make. If you're spending a lot of money on energy, why would you want to spend more money on energy? Anything that reduces your energy footprint has got to be a good thing for your bottom line. So it's all rhetoric right now about, oh, it's going to constrain us and it's going to be hard and all that. I don't think the consequences of doing something are economically negative. I think that actually you can have positive impacts on the entire economy by taking action. And though the, the study that came out a couple weeks ago about the impact on the British Columbia economy from the carbon tax is that there was no net negative in, impact, but you know it's it's a little bit of a bit of back on the back of the envelope sketch. But I think it's at least persuasive to say that um, it doesn't have to be catastrophic. So I'm not making the argument that the implications are negative. It's that the argument against accepting the premise is that the, the implications are negative. And that's that's what a challenger or someone running in a primary, a Republican running in a primary is facing. You can't appeal to your community by accepting the premise, because then you're saying, then I'll accept doing because something the, about the, the perception that these are the inevitable policy yeah. consequences. Yeah. yeah, you're right that they're not so tightly linked. And the, the whole chain starts way, way back. And, and goes through all the process of uh, uh, implementation of some kind of a decision in ways where there are lots of other linkages that could be contested equally. Because that yeah. comes up in the rhetoric a lot, right? If you listen to the science advocates as they're coming out, quite often the, 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 the main thrust of their, of their policy advice is reduce uh, carbon emissions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. and, and it's sort of like one strategy, mm -hmm. at least from a, sort of the, the layman When in fact, it's far more complicated yeah. than what we could do. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, And then, you know, uh, Ted, who I believe his work on um, uh, what's, what's he working on? Who's on, uh, on, on uh, geoengineering? Geoengineering. Right. He's looking at it in a broad, uh, a broad way, but that's threatening to environmentalism. Geoengineering, because that doesn't do anything about the emissions that you're the activity that causes the emissions, it's all about what you do with the emissions after they've happened. And that's, to me, you know, to the environmental movement, that's a scary thing because it's not changing lifestyle, it's not changing behavior. It's, a, it's assigning a technology to fix a problem at another point. Well, there should be a link then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, I think we're... It's more prayer and less sinning. Yes. More prayer and less sinning. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I'm well, on that note, <laughs> you we can you start. go to lunch. You do not have any cake. Um, for those of us who are coming back to CFGS, Jen would normally do this. Uh, she had an appointment, yeah. so we can all yeah, yeah. kind of okay. Jen. Yep. Yeah, let's see you do it, lady. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I we'll follow your example. <laughs>